you. <clears throat> Harvard can be a strange and difficult place for a newcomer, freshman, professor, or poet. I remember a new colleague telling me that although everyone was friendly and polite, he could not find the center of the place. He always felt lost. That was not Seamus. Seamus had his own center. He also had his own home at Harvard. When he first came to the university in 1979, the English department welcomed him warmly as visiting professor. But it was in 1981 when he moved into eye entry of Adam's house that he became one of us, a neighbor, a friend, a member of the family. The guest suite in I Entry was not a five-star accommodation. These rooms were only a step up from the days of the founding Puritan fathers. There was indoor plumbing, electricity, a bed, a desk, a table, and a few chairs. A visiting professor who had arrived near midnight some years earlier phoned me to say that the place had no door and she was afraid to go to bed. Buildings and grounds had been working on the room and had not quite finished their job. I told her to pile furniture at the threshold and try to get some sleep. We did install a door before Seamus arrived. In any case, <clears throat> he never complained. In fact, I think he liked the spare simplicity, the convenience, the company when he wanted it, and the solitude when he needed it. When Mari came for visits, she put flowers on the table and said, it made them feel like newlyweds. Seamus came back every year for one semester. It soon seemed as though he had always been there with us, taking meals in the dining hall, chatting with someone in Randolph Court, reading poetry, and listening attentively and with evident pleasure to students reading their own poetry in the common rooms. Like any true survivor at Harvard, Seamus learned how to disappear and do his work but he also loved celebrations and a good party. One of his favorite Adams occasions was the St. Patrick's Day tea at Apthorpe House. He often brought Irish friends who could sing or play the penny whistle. Students tried to dance something resembling an Irish jig. He would stand on a chair and recite poems, beaming all the while, not for the attention he was getting, but because of the attention poetry was getting. When he was informed of the Nobel Prize, he was traveling in Greece. He phoned to say he couldn't keep the astonishing news to himself. It was during a tea, so I announced it to the assembled crowd of students who cheered so lustily he could hear them in Athens. Seamus was a great storyteller as well as a great poet. Among the many stories he told, there are two about Ireland, poets and poetry, that keep coming back to me. One night when he was driving alone through the Irish countryside after an event, a wedding or banquet, he was stopped by a patrolman for speeding. The patrolman seemed tired, wet, and angry. Show me your driver's license, he shouted as if to a deaf man. Seamus began fumbling around in his pockets, realizing he may have forgotten to carry it with him. The patrolman shone a flashlight into the car as if looking for contraband. Can you identify yourself? Seamus noticed an envelope with his name and address on the empty seat next to him. Will this do? The patrolman shone his light on the name, looked up and said, the poet? Seamus nodded modestly. Drive on, said the patrolman. <laughs> I love that story, only in Ireland. The other story is about a poet looking for a poet who was not an Irishman. Seamus loved the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins. He knew that Hopkins had been sick, lonely, and unhappy in Dublin, that he died there, and though an Englishman, he was buried in Glasnevin Cemetery, where Irish patriots had also been laid to rest. One day, Seamus decided that he wanted to visit Hopkins' grave. In an almost Shakespearean scene, the young Irish poet got lost among the tombstones. Unable to find his way to Hopkins until he came upon two gravediggers. I'm looking for Gerard Manley Hopkins, he said. Who? 
The poet, Hopkins. The first grave digger shrugged and looked at his mate. Have you heard of a Hopkins? The second grave digger scratched his chin, looked at Seamus and said, oh, you mean the convert? <laughs> and then glanced over his shoulder and said with a nod, he's over there. <laughs> I hardly need to say that Seamus loved Ireland. But like those ancient Irish monks who sailed off in the Currucks and made themselves at home all over the world, Seamus was a hearty traveler. And through his poetry and generous disposition, his was a welcome presence and voice in many parts. I've saved my last memory and my most treasured copy of a message from Seamus to Harvard, to all of us that most of you, I think, will not have read or heard. I don't think this has ever been published. In the spring of 1982, Adams House celebrated the 50th anniversary of its founding. Throughout the semester, of course, this was Adams House, there were festivities, an original opera, an art show, concerts, poetry readings, and finally a banquet. Seamus, of course, was there. As a surprise, he composed a poem and dedicated it to Adam's house. I now hear this as a toast to Harvard, a thank you note to all of us, and a lighthearted but serious reminder of what we can be at our best and why he liked being here, and though he doesn't put it this way, why we loved having him with us. So here's the poem, Anniversary Verse. Master Kiley, guests and friends, tutors, tutees, alumni, students, you staircase dwellers whose amplified hard rock and reggae resound from every dormitory, you 50th anniversary revelers, ye maids and swains of Adam's house, ye actors, athletes, sexy muses, ye gilded youth, I rise to rise to the occasion and not disgrace my art or nation with verse that sings the old equation of beauty and truth. I rise as one who comes and goes beneath your storied walls and windows, a visitor, part tourist and part faculty, an ethnic curiosity, dubbed by grace of poetry, guest lecturer. Inspire me then, occasional muse, with verse to cure the exam blues and banish care to greet old academic ghosts who once caroused on the Gold Coast, whose love of learning vied with lusts for flesh and beer. That I may briefly celebrate community, half collegiate and half domestic, and say a word about the way a scholar's personality can keep its health emotionally, yet stay scholastic. The diapers we first were dressed in our graduation gowns of ermine, which would you say will mean more to us in the end? Those powdered folds pinned tight around our little backsides or that grand scholar's regalia? All of us are amphibious between our universities and where we come from. No one gets born in a campus bed. Even the trendiest school of ed has never weaned or bathed or breastfed or wiped a bum. No co-ed dorm supplies the joys of an attic full of dusty toys and old dolls' houses. No faculty of engineering repeats the thrill of tinkering with model planes that hankering to fly with aces. It seems illiterate solitude is the first place that the true and good awakens in us. The later freedom we call leisure cannot supply that buried treasure, which is the basis and the measure of personalities, and which we name imagination. A word I cite with much elation and some unease, because it can sound slight and airy, an entry in the dictionary, a bubble word. Yet while I'm wary, I realize all need its salutary power. All men and women must beware who would deny it and go against their childhood's grain and dry up like earth 
parched for rain. They'll grow mechanical, and then no drug or diet, no health farm, clinic, yoga course, no mantra, om, no Star Wars force will compensate for what is lost when the mind divides. Even science now concedes the brain has two conjugal sides, the left and right, that have to marry intuition to the analytic reason for psychic balance. Head sleeps with heart, begets a creature, free, yet cornered in its nature. To be your whole self, you must mate your brains and glands. Which is why I bless the atmosphere of Adam's house and toast our master and his wife. I toast good nature in the staff, the way that nothing's done by half. Those who work hard and still can laugh are the spice of life. I like your hospitality, your literate vitality, your casual styles, the way that love of liberal arts and loves inspired by Cupid's darts have educated all your hearts, is in your smiles. So all together, Gaudiemus, because as sure as my name's Seamus, <laughs> today's the day for intellectuals to play. On your 50th anniversary, rejoice, as the jazz men say, take it away. <laughs> <laughs>